but he graduated magna cum laude from Rice with a BA in economics and managerial uh, studies. And he became a financial risk manager certificate holder in 99 and a CA chartered financial analyst uh, in 2001, which is a big uh, designation. <coughs> And since then, he's been trading uh, proprietary for firms and so forth. Just some of the files I have from just the last couple of years have to do with asymmetric returns, buying 52-week highs. Uh, he sends me daily trade journals. We have other kinds of market on close trades and all kinds of trades set up. And I just realize how far behind I am every time I try to look on these trades. So anyway, Ron Don, if you could just come up and speak to us about this, I would really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Is this working? Yes, yep. it will be turned on. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, today, I want to talk about trading, uh, creating trading systems. Um, I, I guarantee you this is very conceptually uh, important. Um, it's not the same sexy trading stuff perhaps I've gone over in the past. Hit this uh, button down here. There you go. Uh, but I think this is really important because it's the method. The method is more important than any one system or any one edge. Um, just having a robust way to analyze different things against each other is, is going to serve you uh, serve you well. Um, oh, and up here, that, that's my um, Twitter handle. And I've just started a YouTube channel. And I just started posting things on there just because trading is one of those things where you sit in a room all by yourself. And you're going to drive yourself crazy unless you have an outlet. So that's uh, become my latest outlet. So the consistency, uh, oh, well, I guess let me go back a step. Why do we want trading systems? Um, you know, there's either systematic trading or there's discretionary trading. And you can do both. And in all the years I've done this, there is a certain je ne sais quoi to discretionary trading that I don't think a computer can replicate. Um, you know, there's already so many computers mining so much data you know, taking a lot of the automated stuff away. Uh, there's just something about it that I can't quite put my finger on. Uh, it comes from experience. It comes from just being able to differentiate different uh, situations. Um, and, you know, I've had the uh, honor to work with one of the best in discretionary uh, trading, Linda Rashke. Um, you know, and, and we comment on the same thing, which is, you know, there's, there's no better game than discretionary. And I felt that there have been times in my career where everything you do is right. You are just on, on, on. And, uh, you know, at least in, in my experience, what ends up changing over life, you know, for me is your life situation. You have a family, you have children, you have health concerns, you have family members with health concerns. There's all kinds of things, uh, you know, that make it hard for you to maintain the kind of consistency that a system will maintain. Um, and, you know, I, I think about it. You know, had people laugh at me in the past about this analogy, but you know, if you think of Michael Jordan getting ready to play in the finals, um, I bet that night before he wasn't out partying. His wife didn't bother him with any issues. Uh, he didn't take care of his sick kid the night before the finals game. He had someone else do it for him. Uh, you know, and because he was about to play the finals game, and discretionary trading is almost like that finals game every single day. You have to maintain the type of routine, the type of normalcy, diet, exercise, everything to be at your peak performance. And that doesn't lend itself well to life because you know life is not, you know, does not come, come that way. But um, so that's one of the reasons that trading systems are important uh, to create uh, consistency. And um, with all of the stuff, you're going to create mental models in your head. You know, I mean, we all have mental models for the way the world works. Um, you know, we're all just humans adapting, and our life experience, uh, you know, gives us ways to to process data. And I would say the same thing, you know, with with trading systems. And one of the important things you need to do is really differentiate from investing and trading. They are two completely different things. Uh, you know, investing is there to store and diversify your wealth, you know, augment it if possible. You know, typically not thinking about leverage, you know, maybe with real estate there's some leverage, but, but otherwise, um, 
you know, and, and to arbitrarily measure your wealth in dollars, it's purely arbitrary. You know, wealth should be measured in time. If you have enough assets such that you've got 30 years of your expenses covered, that's a certain amount of wealth. And if all of that is, you know, $5 million in a bank account and tomorrow the dollar becomes worthless, well, you don't have 30 years of expenses covered anymore. But if you had a little bit of land, a little bit of gold, a little bit of equities, you know, various, uh, you, know, di you know, diversified things, you probably still have 30 years, maybe 25 years. You, you have something uh, there. And so, you know, investments can protect you from certain binary outcomes, like, you know, hyperinflation is the one that I would think about. If you've got all your money in the bank account, it could go to zero. If you've got all your money in a trading account, you know, you might have excellent returns year to year to year, but it could all go to zero one night if there's a hyperinflationary event. Um, things like systemic collapses. You know, if there's a systemic collapse, you may lose certain financial assets. You might lose certain cash assets. It's probably not going to affect your land. It's not going to affect gold you have in your safe, you know, things like that. Um, you know, and, and, you know, with all the stuff going on in the world, you know, think about, I mean, we're blessed and lucky to be here. What if we were doing this class in Ukraine at the moment? You know, you have land. Is Russia going to take it over? And is it going to be your land anymore? You know, you have gold in your safe. Is your building going to get blown up today? And you don't have that anymore? Um, you know, and, and that's kind of where Bitcoin becomes a little interesting because all your money could be in the eco, you know, wherever Bitcoin is. Uh, and you've got the, you know, the code in your head. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, this is probably a, you know, first good test of, of, of that uh, scenario. Uh, and when you're investing, valuations, fundamentals, diversifications, dividend yields, all that stuff matters when you're investing. Um, now you have to, you know, you guys are in, in a place where you're learning all these different things and you want to be able to categorize things separately. This is completely not that. This is what I'm about to show you with trading systems. You have to almost think of it like a game, and the dollar is your score. Um, and so you do measure it against dollars, because at the end of the day, you know, if you have a trading system, you have a fund running a trading system, you have to show returns in terms of dollars. Um, and the, the goal is to increase that score with, the minimal, with minimal drawdowns, because the, the better your return to risk ratio, the more leverage you can apply safely to a trading system. Um, and then, you know, trading may protect you from certain market crashes. If you have a, a certain market conditions, you know, if, if you have a system that gets you back in cash every night, well, you're probably going to be okay if there was a market crash. You wake up one day and we're down 25% or, I guess, limit down and several days uh, that happens. But it's not necessarily going to protect you from other outcomes like hyperinflation because your money's all in cash. Um, so with trading, what I'm going to focus on is only using things like price and volume, uh, time of day, uh, just objective inputs, uh, which is kind of different from from value, uh, you know, evaluating things, uh, evaluating things with fundamentals, where you're using a judgment of, well, I think the oil is going to go this way, and because these people don't like these people, and you know, it's going to happen this way. And there's a lot more uh, gray areas. So the simplest trading system has two uh, components to it an edge and a uh, money management uh, program. So an edge basically just means a positive uh, expectation. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot one point about this is as you go forward in your life and your career, I would say align with that which fits your natural demeanor. Not everybody has the natural demeanor to be a trader, and it can be very enticing because of the, the, the dopamine, uh, because of the rewards. Uh, but if that doesn't fit your natural demeanor, long term you're going to be miserable, um, you know, and probably not as successful as if you were to pick something that fits your demeanor. And perhaps with investing, you know, that's a totally different demeanor. And um, they're really just kind of personality, uh, you know, differences. And maybe at different times in your life, a different one may may fit better. Um, but that's just something to, uh, to keep in mind. So if we go on to quite simply what an edge is, right? An edge is just your, the expected return, which is the probability of a win times the size of your win minus the probability of a loss times the size of your loss. And uh, for trading systems, what I'll do is I'll introduce a concept called R, where you're, you're measuring your wins in terms of R, which is your risk amount. So if we played a game where we're going to roll a dice, and a one or two, you lose your bet, and a three, four, five, or six, you win your bet. Well, that bet is R. Um, and I just rolled a three, so you win your bet amount, whatever amount that you bet. Um, and we can very easily calculate what that edge is right here, just with, with the simple expectation formula. 
And that just means in this particular game, every time you roll a dice, you expect to make 0.33%, I mean, 0.33 of your bet. Uh, but of course, it's going to come in a lumpy fashion, you know, in a binary minus one or plus one fashion. But over a, a large number of rolls, you're going to make 0.33 per, per roll. So how do we, you know, I'm going to show you the money management and the rest of this trading system in the framework of uh, the, you know, the dice game. But how do we convert trading into a dice game? Well, we just need to have, you know, everything needs to be very specific. You need a specific precondition as to why you're going to enter a trade, a specific and definable pattern, and your entry and your exit, uh, well, your entry and your stop need to be defined, like a, like a dollar level defined, uh, because that tells you what your R is, what your risk is. Your exit can either be defined, you know, in an actual number or by an actual condition, but you already know your worst case is your entry minus your stop. So your worst case is already predefined, fixed. Your exit uh, cannot be worse than that. It can only be better than that. Um, and then it's objective. And then you would want to use a large sample size across various market conditions. If you notice that something you know, works well, 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 well for all these months, and then all of a sudden it, it doesn't, and then all of a sudden it does, there's probably a filter out there that you can use to know when you want to use this system and when you don't want to use this system. Um, so, uh, I forgot to change that sentence there. I, you know, I don't optimize. I do optimize. Uh, I just have all, I put in another section on optimization. Optimizing is, is kind of a dirty word, and you have to be very careful with, with how you do it. Um, the way I like to optimize is rather than randomly telling the computer, go run all these numbers here, you know, and tell me which one's best. If I actually observe something in my day-to-day -day monitoring of markets, and I say, that, that looks interesting. I've seen that before. Then I'll go back and test that specific condition. Um, so I prefer to do that than just randomly optimizing. So then how are we going to find an edge in the market? Well, you know, I've spent the better part of 20 plus years, probably 8 to 12 hours a day in front of the screen, and you just notice things. You notice things that don't seem random. So when something appears not to be random, gather the relevant data, construct a hypothesis, develop simple rules of how you would take advantage of that and test that hypothesis, Analyze your results. If they're great, implement it. If they're not, rework it or scrap it and go on to the next. And uh, um, I probably got a toolbox of about 70 edges that still work. And it's a lot to maintain in one head. I, I end up kind of focusing on, on a few of them. If, if you, in theory, had the supercomputer, you would have a little bit of capital allocated to each of those 70 systems. And the diversifying effect of that creates a smoother and smoother equity curve uh, for you. And you know, if you think about um, the edge in a casino game, you know, most casino games like uh, uh, roulette or um, craps, someone can mathematically calculate what is the house's edge. And so, you know, I, I guarantee you, these casinos before putting billions of dollars on it have already done that, uh, and they know the edge is in their in their favor. And then they just want to have a lot of people come in and and, and play it. So over time, they they make money. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, you know, with a system. Uh, the, the, the key difference being, you know, a, a casino game is a closed system. Um, a uh, market uh, trading system is not closed in that something that has worked historically, something that works now, doesn't have to work tomorrow. So you always have to keep that in mind, uh, you know, versus a closed system. So um, this is a trade. I think I mentioned this in one of my prior um, presentations, and I just wanted to, you know, give you an example of, this is a system that I created probably 2007 or 8, and it still works to this day. And the way I created it was, I just noticed that the movement in the last five minutes of the market is not random. It tends to go up, 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 or down, 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 about 40% of the time, when in reality, you know, Two raised to five thirty-two. You know, it ought to be about six percent of the time that that uh, you know that each one of those happens. So, um, okay, the data you need is one-minute data over that time. You know, those time periods. Um, my hypothesis is that the last five minutes tends to trend with higher, uh, you know, higher lows or lower highs. Is what I was testing as opposed to just the actual close. Um, so how can I take advantage of that? Well, as soon as this bar opens, let's put a buy stop six ticks above, let's put a sell stop six ticks below. Whichever one takes me in, takes me in. The other one becomes my initial stop. 
and then you know start trailing it. So once uh, this bar uh, this bar is complete and we go on to this bar, I move my stop to one tick below this. As soon as you know this bar starts, this one completes, I'll move my bar, move it here, move it here. And you know that, that way you just kind of minimize your risk and over time you're locking in profits even if you have, have a, a uh, you know one of these bars that it doesn't finish that way. Um, and then just exit right at the, the final close. Uh, so this is just an example of, of how, you know, just applying scientific method. Here's something that looks non-random. There's a data I need. How can I take advantage of that? Let's test it. Let's see if it works. Um, and here are a couple of examples. Um, this must have been back post-COVID, yeah, probably April or so, or maybe even during COVID. So the, the, it turns out that one of the filters that works well for this trade is the more volatile the day is, uh, the more, the bigger the last move is. And you know, this is a one minute chart. Um, it's, this is a one minute chart. It should be opened at 29.12.75. So a six tick stop would be 29.11.25. And you know none of these uh, things got violated, right? The the higher low, uh, uh, each one of these made a higher low, and that very last bar really pushed up, right into three o'clock, and it actually closed on the high at twenty nine fifty eight fifty. So, you know, you essentially, if you bought in three ticks higher, that would be fourteen twenty five, you know, fourteen to fifty eight. You made forty four points on a three point risk. That's, that's an amazing... Leave a market on close open that whole time for those five minutes? No, I, 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 I actually randomly, I mean, manually hit the sell market button like maybe a second or two before the close. Um, there are way more sophisticated ways to execute this stuff. Um, I, I'm just very old school about executing myself. Um, and then here's another example on a day where we had the opposite happen, where we started here and there's, there's no tail on this. So, you know, there wasn't even any, uh, you know, thought of it going the other way, you know, six ticks later you're in and we keep making lower highs and we closed on the low right there. So 2760 to 2723, 37 points, you know, 35 points on, on three, uh, points of risk. Um, and then there, there are going to be plenty of days where you get chopped up and you lose three points. You know, or what ends up happening more is you lose less than three points because you've trailed and then you get one of those bars that comes out of order. Um, but, you know, and then I, I haven't even had time or, you know, capacity to go anywhere, but a similar thing happens, you know, sometimes in crude oil. This was a month end, uh, I believe this was August, uh, sorry, yeah. April 30th. Yeah, this was April 30th, the end of the month trade. And, you know, we had this huge move. You know, seventeen dollars to eighteen dollars, you know, a dollar sixty, almost a ten percent move in crude, eight or nine percent move in crude in just the last five minutes. And, and again, the reason these things happen is somebody has, you know, there are some large trade based on the close. So someone out in the world is probably helping this get there, uh, and it may cost them money to actually make it get there because they have a way larger bet somewhere else that pays off to make that go somewhere. Um, th 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 that's my thing with crude because you know, like, like a lot of uh, hedging of tankers and stuff happens on on the close. On the, you know, they, like if I buy a tanker from you now, uh, we say, hey, in this you know th two weeks from now, because you know it's, it's in the middle of the ocean. Two weeks from now, we'll pick these three days, and I'm going to pay the average of the settle on those three days. Yeah. Well, you've got the incentive to make those three days higher, you know, and I have the incentive to make those three days lower. If we're both large trading companies, we, you know, it probably nets out if. You're just a provider, you know, a, a producer that digs up from the ground, doesn't trade. Maybe, you know, the part, you know, the, the party that has the trading operation takes advantage of that. Um, and then, you know, my mental model for the why this happens in stocks is, you know, think about how much money is just indexed to the S&P 500. And, you know, when the market is really volatile, you have people hitting sell or buy on their 401k. And you know, whenever you hit buy or sell on a mutual fund, um, it tells you you will get a 4 p.m. close today. So as we get closer and closer to 4 p.m., you know, Vanguard, Fidelity, all these guys, they know, hey, I've got 10 billion to sell or I've got 10 billion to buy, and they can't risk misexecuting. Uh, you know, if, if the close was exactly 3,000 and they, you know, they're trying to sell and they only achieve 2998, that's you know, on $10 billion, that's a $6 billion risk there. And they have razor thin margins on, on index funds, you know, very low expense ratios. So, um, you know, my working theory of what they do is they, 
uh, he, she, they, or them, uh, guarantee, you know, they work with an executioner uh, that uh, guarantees uh, the closing price. So it's like a, a prearranged deal where you need $10 billion of this, and I say, I will give you the closing price, whatever that price is. It's floating right now. We don't know what that price is. But now when you give me that order, I'm incentivized to step it up at an accelerating pace and make it close, like if you're buying, close it exactly on the high, and that becomes the price of our transaction. And along the way, I actually achieved a lower price getting there. And vice versa, if you're selling it to me, I, you know, and if we go back to those uh, charts, you'll see how the volume accelerates, you know, from uh, 255, 256, 257, 258, 259, that volume accelerates and just kind of really puts, you know, push, put the foot on the gas because whatever that price is, is what Fidelity gets, or Vanguard gets, you know, which, which again, you know, like in the oil example, mom and pop buying 401k, buying or selling mutual funds has no pricing power. That executioner who's handling that very large order over that very small period of time gets to sort of push it the way, you know, that benefits them. Isn't that kind of like putting a swap out there? Yeah, so, so the prearranged deal we have where you're gonna get the close, that's essentially a swap. And then the way that I would hedge that is, is by pushing it into the close and I have futures, then your futures and your swap will, will net out, uh, risk-wise. But then- The execution people. Yeah, yeah, as of the execution people, right. So, so this is, and that's my theory, right? I have no idea that that's actually what's going on out there. Um, I have friends uh, that, uh, you know, had worked for other funds before that have explained things similar to this, but this makes complete sense to me because, you know, ever since, you know, I've, had a 401k, you know, I, I really, it always gives you the four o'clock price. Um, and so that's just my mental model for why this period of time is non-random. And, you know, and there was a, um, a counter to this is typically after there's a good MOC move, the first few minutes of, of uh, you know, after the close bounce back up. And, you know, my mental model for that is, you know, if I'm stepping on it, stepping on it, stepping on it, stepping on it, and all of a sudden, you know, like, let's say I know that I need to sell 50,000 contracts, uh, you know, that's the amount that, that I'm going to owe uh, Fidelity. I, you know, step on it, step on it, step on it, and somewhere down here I'm losing control because, you know, there's another force, maybe a fund, maybe a sovereign fund, you know, someone else is coming in and trying to buy the clothes. I would step on it extra hard. I mean, I'm, I'm just putting my, myself in their head. I, I don't do this. <laughs> Anyone's watching, I don't do this. I'm just putting myself in the head of who the, the executioner doing this. I would step on it and put an extra 10,000 and sell 60,000 and then take a loss and buy back that 10,000 because the 50,000 is gonna get set at this price. So if that 50,000, you know, if I don't step on it and that, pop, oops, and that pops up to here, I'm gonna lose a lot of money. So I would make sure it closes down here and then worry about it you know, pretty soon right thereafter. So um, now what if we change uh, the dice game? So, so all of this was to just tell you how we convert a trading system, you know, that we've observed and developed into the dice game. So we can have certain stats that say it wins X percent of time. When you win, you get this many R's. When you lose, you lose that many R's. Um, and then test it over a long period of time. Uh, now, what if we change the game? You know, now if you roll a one or a two, you're going to win three times your bet. If you roll a three, four, five, or six, you're going to lose your bet. So the edge is still the same, 0.33. So is this a better? Is this better or worse than the last game? Anyone have an idea? Maybe the same. Same. So from an expectation standpoint, uh, it is the same. Uh, now, when you look at streaks, if you're winning two thir uh, one third of the time and losing two thirds of the time, I just did a quick simulation of 250 trades, uh, and it came out this way, where you, you have streaks of zero to five, right? You're, you're losing two thirds of the time, and the biggest streak you had was, was five wins. Now, if you had the other situation where you're winning two thirds of the time and losing a third of the time, your streaks look like this, where, you know, you know, again, a third of the time you're losing, but then your streaks went all the way up to 13. And there's quite a bit of long streaks in there. Um, you know, again, here you're only winning one unit, here you're winning three units. Um, so there's another way to address, uh, you know, these types of things. And um, this, I think, is probably the 
because it says the definitive guide on position sizing strategies. I, I did find it very definitive. Um, you know, the frequency of trade is important. And, uh, you know, he has something called an SQN 100, which is a normalized trade. And game one has a higher SQN than game two, because although the expectation is the same, the standard deviation is twice as high um, when you have that three minus one versus the one one situation. Um, and, you know, so, uh, and part of what I wanted to um, impart here is that the edge itself is not that important. People focus so much on the edge and, uh, oh, wow, this is 63% winner. Oh, well, if I spend another, you know, four months on it, I can make it a 65% winner. It, it, that, that's far less important. Now, now we'll go into the money management part. Um, you know, here's a system that I have in development right now, and it only wins 50% of the time. And it's only profitable 55% of the days, uh, but it has a daily SQN 100 number greater than three. Uh, and, you know, part of this is, uh, you know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, it has, has a large number of trades, which helps smooth things out, but that's a pretty nice looking equity curve over the course of, of a year. Um, you, know, you know, not that many drawdowns and just slow and steady eddy. So uh, this is an example of the SQN uh, being, being a good measure. A lot of people look at something like that's called profit factor. That's a pretty mediocre profit factor. Um, but that's not a mediocre chart. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the difference is, um, you know, using some sort of method of, of stabilizing the, the standard deviation of your expected return. If you want to get into more details with optimization and evaluating trading systems, this is like the, I, I consider this to be like the textbook on that. It's very, very technical. Um, now, like, Early in my career, it was actually my, my first uh, internship uh, at a Rice. I worked for a company, I'll leave them nameless, uh, but they were building trading systems. And uh, one of the things they did was, it was very simple moving average type trading systems. And they had you know, various parameters for what's the first moving average, what's the second moving average. Uh, you know, there were probably four or five different parameters. And they optimized to the tune of five or six million different things and they found something that worked well. Then they put real money on it and started doing it, and they lost like five or six million dollars pretty quickly. <laughs> and you know, th th so that was a, a significant uh, milestone in my, you know, uh, in my career to, to, to learn. And, and they later implemented it properly. I mean, you, you can look at the significance of what you're doing versus randomness. You know, if, if the odds of it being random are one in five million, and then you try five million parameters, all of a sudden your odds of it being random went up a lot. Um, so your odds, you know your odds of it being random are one in five million and you try a hundred things, that's probably okay. Um, and in general, you know, it's the experience I've had, simpler is better, it's more robust, has a longer shelf life. Um, so yeah. Oh, and I had a, uh, had a fun, I forgot to note to myself here, you know, back on the uh, MOC trade, I had a fun uh, anecdote, I remember, uh, I forgot exactly what year it was. It might have been 2008 or it might have been 2010. Uh, I was skiing in Mount Hood. So I have a uh, teacher that I go skiing with. This guy was my eighth grade algebra teacher. He was my sixth grade gym teacher. Had him for various classes, seventh, eighth, ninth. Um, we've met all over the world to go skiing. He's, he's a very, very good skier. Um, and uh, I just remember it was a time of market volatility. And I just kind of timed you know, my descent from the mountain with enough time to get to the car, open up the laptop, have this little Verizon MiFi thing. And I just remember like that, that you know, I, I just knew the conditions were good in the market for this one little trade. So it's like, well, you know, it's a little bit of an inconvenience, but for this little five minute period, I made three or $4,000, you know, and it's funny, I'm sitting in the back of my thing with my boots on, yeah. boom, 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 done, put your boots back on, go back up, up the mountain. Um, and, you know, this has been robust. I've been trading it since 07, 08. I'm sure it was there long before I've done it. I, I still trade it at times. It still works. And, you know, when you think of the shelf life of a system, you have to ask yourself the other part of it, which is how, you know, what is the inefficiency on the other side of this that's allowing this to persist? And the inefficiency is just the structural way in which people buy mutual funds. They all get the close factor. So if, if that rule changes in the future for some, you know, and, you know, maybe they could go to a VWAP, you know, where the volume weighted average price throughout the day is the price you get, you know, that, I don't want to give anyone any ideas.
he is. Uh, but um, uh, you know, but there's a structural reason for why that you know why that inefficiency exists. So back to Pardo. Um, so now let's let's talk about money management. Now I've, I've, I've kind of given it away. The money management aspect of this is, is more important. And, and by money management, I mean position sizing. Sometimes money management means your financial advisor that throws you in. 60, 40 stocks and bonds. But we're talking about money management in, in the term of like a bankroll management. If you were, you know, at a casino and managing your bankroll. So here's a game I want everyone to play along with. You know, we're going back to the first game. You know, one, two, three, four. You, in fact, I think I have it backwards, but whatever. One, two, three, four. You win your bet. Five, six. You lose your bet. And I'm going to give you hundred dollars to start to play with. Right. That, that's all the money you have. At, you know, at this casino. So obviously, God, this is an amazing game. You know, like you don't, you know, you want to be able to partake in this game, um, especially when it's a closed system with the dice. So, so let's, let's do a few rolls, and everybody write down how much you would bet on the very first roll. And then I'll tell you what the roll is. <laughs> okay. So if you've written down your amount. The uh, first roll was a six, so you lost your bet. Then think again. Now, now, now that you've lost your bet, you know, subtract that from your hundred dollars. How much are you going to bet on this next roll? It's five. I'm a bad roller. Okay, it's a five. So you lost your bet again. Um, so now, you know, subtract that number again, and and write down what you're going to bet on this third roll. It's five. <laughs> Lost our money quickly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then, you know, so do the same thing. A four. So you won this time. So add that, add your bet to there, and decide how much you're going to bet on the fifth roll here. It's a one. And you won. Do the same thing. Four. You won. We're even. <laughs> do the same thing. One. You won. Let's do one more here. Two. So you won. So we had kind of a streak of three losers and then four or five winners. I'm not sure how many times I did it. Um, so how much did everyone bet on that first roll? Five? One? Two? Wait, so how much might? How much did you bet on the first roll? How much money to begin with again? A uh, hundred. I bet 66. You bet 66? Yes. Okay. Wow, you got a gambler. <laughs> what did you bet on the second roll? Uh, I was bet uh, two thirds of the total amount. Bet two thirds of the total amount. For some reason. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't have the time to, rest, to fully write now my choices. But yeah. So, you know, a couple of questions come to mind like, how many times do I get to play this game? If I can play this game as fast as I can roll for as long as I live, you know, well, crap, bet a dollar, you'll never lose. You know, you're going to just build that up forever. You can play exactly 30 times before this game closes. OK, there's a different answer for that. Um, it may be 66. <laughs> um, bad rolls. <laughs> yeah, bad rolls. <laughs> so, so what did happen to you after, after the second roll then? Oh, oh, you always do 66. Yeah, I always, I always do like 66. OK, so you'll never go bankrupt technically because, you know. The market gets smaller. <laughs> yeah, because the bet gets smaller and smaller. So there's two different ways to bet. One is called Martingale, and one is anti-Martingale. So Martingale is, you know, you might have heard the story of a guy that goes and plays blackjack. I lose, I'm gonna double my bet. I lose, I'm gonna double my bet. I lose, I'm gonna double my bet. And he eventually breaks even. If he if he has the staying power, he, she, yeah. they, them has the staying power to, um, you know, keep doubling until until they get back to even, which is part of the reason, uh, you know, they put table limits in. There. So what we want to do is not Martingale. Martingale is destruction, you know, very destructive. Um, very few people can uh, stay the course of that mentally. Uh, and then also, you know, typically the big money is managed money. You're managing other people's money, especially when there's one layer of, of separation like that. No investor is going to let you uh, do this type of, of thing. You know, and, and you shouldn't be doing it. You don't need to do it. So here's a quote, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Amazing guy has been around for a very, very long time. Um, and it, it's so great when I, you know, when you hear him talk, what he says sounds so simple. And it is simple. And it's, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more complexity to things and the way he handles them. But he just understands things so well that he can explain them so simply. 
And what he's basically describing here is an anti-Martingale strategy. Um, where he keeps reducing his size and that way when he's trading his worst, he's trading uh, the smallest size possible. So, you know, we've eliminated Martingale strategies. We have even betting and we have anti-Martingale strategies. Um, I think this is where I'm supposed to go to Excel. Or not here, I've got another page here. Um, the, the, the two anti-Martingale strategies I'm gonna look at here, uh, one is called fix, fixed fractional money management. And this is basically what you were doing. You're, you're betting a fixed percentage of your bankroll on each trade. Um, it's good for a large account uh, and it's a more gradual anti-Martingale strategy. And then fixed ratio money management, uh, you know, this one is where you bet a fixed amount plus X percent of accumulated gains. And what this does is this, this is more reactive uh, when you're on a winning streak, your bet size increases automatically. When you're on a losing streak, you know, the, the same, you know, that's just anti martingale The same applies to both. It's just more pronounced here. And this is good for small accounts because it quickly adjusts and, you know, within a few trades when you have one streak, uh, you'll uh, ramp it up faster. So uh, I'm going to take a look at these simulations and basically, you know, the, the inputs are your win rate your win outcome, your loss outcome, and the percentage of capital you risk on each trade. With fixed ratio, there's just one more thing, you know, which is your increasing factor, your, you know, your plus X percent, that X is, is one more factor. Um, okay, yeah, that was my artwork, we'll look at that next, but let me go to the Excel sheet. And I did this, you know, again, a simulation over 250 days. Um, oops, did this one first. Can you see that? Uh, okay. Now, if, if we do a fixed fractional with zero, that's basically even betting. You're betting $1,000 each time, right? This is your, your risk amount. And if I hit F9, this will just re-simulate a bunch of things. And we know that flat betting, you should make about, you know, our edge is 0 0.33 times 250 trades, we should make 83,333. And so if we start with 100,000, in this simulation we made under 160. And yeah, so keep paying attention to the scale here, 180. 170, 100, well, we're getting more than that. Oh, there we go, here we finally got a little bit more than that. Um, when, I, when I just kind of run through and do a bunch of these, you know, sometimes you, you end up with about 160 to 200, because you're just even, you're even betting. Now, let's go to a fixed fractional, and we're just gonna bet 1% of our uh, thing, and again, this, the win rate is 66, you know, percent. Um, and you can see that, okay, the numbers are, you know, climbing over 200, 180, we got to 200, 200. Um, and some of these will pop in even higher, there's 250, we got above 250. And, and the volatility of this, you know, the, the range of this is greater than the fixed betting and we do end up positively getting better. You know, that's over 300,000, that last one, you know, this one's close to 300. And, you know, if we change something like this, 2%, and all of a sudden, you know, we're looking at numbers like 500, 700, uh, 450, 500. And again, you could simulate this a thousand times and, and make yourself a nice little distribution to, to understand it better. Um, and I wanted to go to fixed ratio. Now, if you set this to something small like 5%, all of a sudden, you know, again, you started with the same thousand dollar bet, but when you catch those win streaks, you do so much better. And so there we go, that one hit a million. That one hit 1.2 million. This one's 1.2 million, 900. And this one's over 1.4 million. 5% um, is very conservative. In practice, I use something closer to 20%. And I mean, this gets ridiculous, right? Because the casino is not gonna sit around and let you win that much money. You know, the liquidity in your market is not gonna be that much. But all of this is tempered, all of this is tempered by the fact that 
if you're, you know, if you're trading your own money, that's one thing. If you're trading other people's money, they like to see a statement every month. Yeah. And, you know, let's say this was the end of the month and they're so happy that you were up, you know, 500% or whatever. And then let's say this is the end of the next month and they're like, what, you're down 30%? You know, and, and you lose all your investors. So the, the practical way of doing that is, is, you know, you can use a factor like 20%, but you're basically resetting every month or every quarter, depending on, on the expectations of the people who are watching what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but in all my work, 20 has kind of worked out to be optimal. Um, you know, let's go back to fixed fractional with a 66% bet. And, you know, it's, it's a little too high, you know, I mean, oh, wow, that's, that's five billion. Like, you know, hopefully you would have you stopped at four billion, you know. <laughs> um, and, and like I said, you, you, you technically never go bankrupt. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just kind of asymptotes down there. Um, okay, Dr. Potomano. Yes. Soon to be Dr. Potomano. So let's say you're, in fact, trading this for other people's money. Now, this, you take it from 180 and it pops up to 700. Mm -hmm. Don't you take half a million of that and put it in the bank somewhere? Um, How? What is the equivalent to doing that when you're trading other people's? That is kind of um, that's a that's an emotional construct, right? It, it's not a mathematical construct. I mean, it makes sense. You know, it makes sense to the human, the emotional. So, so again, this goes back to being clear in your mind as to what you're doing. If your goal is, wow, I just wanted to make half a million bucks, I made it, you know, and you left the casino at four billion, great, you know. Um, but if you don't stop there, you keep doing it. Yeah. Year after year after year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, you can define it, and you know, the the. The thing I've learned the most in trading is there's a million ways to successfully do it. Every single one of those ways requires very specifically defining what you're going to do and what, what you're going to do at each stop, you know, you know, like almost making a decision tree ahead of time to know what you're going to do. If, if, you're up, if you're up 500, okay, I'm going to take it out and put it in the bank. Um, that has to be predefined. And if you don't have rules, the market will suck you in and destroy you. Um, now, here's a really interesting thing to using these, these um, things also. If we go back to even betting, which means a factor of zero. Um, so a casino, you know, this dice game or a casino is a closed system. The market is not an open system. It's not a closed system. What if you had a programming error and your system actually doesn't work? What if the market completely changes and your system doesn't work? Well, that would mean your edge is less than uh, 67. So let's say your edge is. 40%. Well, if you're even betting, well, yeah, that's what you expect. You're going to run yourself into the ground. Um, and the way to see that this goes to the ground is just say you never win. And, you know, you go straight into the ground. Oh, I guess I didn't put in a, a min to stop you at your bankroll. Um, now, what happens with fixed fractional if you had misunderstood your system and you actually don't have an edge? Um, well, it's 67%, obviously, but at, uh, you know, even at 1%. 1%, it looks kind of like the other thing, you know, like a you know, steady roll down. Uh, it, it's actually um, not as bad as, uh, as even betting because your bet size is still decreasing. So let's give this a zero. And you can see that we're asymptoting around, I don't know, call it 10,000 10, or something. Let me do a bunch of simulations and see. Oh, yeah, all of the simulations. Oh, well, because, yeah, there's no variation with a zero win rate. Yeah. Um, win rate for fun. And it just moves ever so slightly. There's not a lot of uh, uh, thing there. Uh, so even betting runs you into the ground. Fixed fractional basically runs you into the ground. You know, if you've only got 10,000 left, that's pretty bad. Now let's take a look at fixed uh, fractional. You know, let's set this factor to 5%. And, you know, we can even set this to zero. See where it asymptotes, it asymptotes at 8,000. It protected you from having a bad system. Um, and then if you increase this factor to 10%, you asymptote at 90,000. It protected you even further. You raise this to 20%, it asymptoted you at 95,000. So what if I told you trade whatever system you want, be mediocrely sure that it's kind of good, who cares, apply this money management, 
I know after 250 trades if your system's good or bad. Because if you, if you are exactly using this money management system, you start with 100,000 and you're at 95,000, your system didn't work. And that's just a whole another way to protect capital when you're looking at a lot of different systems or different people um, to have this, this kind of built in, uh, you know, in addition to giving you the upside. So let's go back to a system where we win 66% of the time. You've got $1.4 billion of upside, not practically because, you know, margin and, and liquidity constraints, but you've got all this kind of upside and then all of a sudden your system goes to heck and it protected you at 95%. I mean, uh, you get to maintain 95% of your capital. Um, so that, that's kind of the, um, the gist of money management. Um, what, what happens at 0.5 for a win rate? 0.5 for a win rate? You get a nice... It ought to be fairly random. Let's see. There's a bunch of simulation. So, you know, it's all going to depend on the streak. But then eventually there's no edge in the system. And it asks them to it's down. Is that right? Let's see. Plus one, minus one at 50%. Yeah. So the, okay, now even betting would probably keep you around um, even the even mark, right? Because e even betting, you know, without taking into account commissions and slippage and all that should just put you around 100,000. So in that situation, this does take you down to 95, to your worst case scenario, even with an even system. But, you know, change this to 51%. You accidentally deleted the first mode. Oh, let's make this 51% and 20%. And I guess that's not, not good enough of an edge. 55, just so we can see it within 250 trades. There you go. Still on. So, yeah. <laughs> And I, I envision these as, um, you know, my, my skills aren't so great, so I just drew these. <laughs> but <laughs> if you did even betting, you have the tightest distribution around your expected value. Yeah. If you do fixed fractional, well, you kind of have a wider distribution and you have more upside. And the virtue of these fat tails pushes your mean to the right. Mm -hmm. And then you do fixed fractional, it's the longest tail, where we saw some of those really positive outcomes, and those positive outcomes really shift your um, mean further right. So when you think about, um, I think one of my first presentation where I was talking about asymmetry in the markets, you know, you want asymmetry in the market you're in, you want asymmetry in your trading system, you want asymmetry in your position size. And you kind of throw all that asymmetry together and right tail things tend to happen for you. Um, so yeah, it, you know, just, just another way to look at uh, asymmetry. Uh, do most fund management, risk management officers do this kind of plots and stuff? I don't know. Um, very few people that I've met that manage money understand this. Um, the people that I've met, like, so uh, I have a friend who manages a good sum of money, and he may not do simulations like this, but when he describes what he does, that's exactly what he's doing. When he's, uh, when he's down, he's taking smaller bets to dig himself out. When he's up, he's swinging with the house's money. Um, so, you know, just conceptually, that is the, um, the, you know, the way to do it. And so it makes me, you know, when I, when I think back and try to analyze what edges he has, well, it really doesn't matter because, you know, he's, he's going to cut the tail off if he keeps losing. Um, I mean, it does matter, but, but it matters less knowing that he's got that mentality. Um, and there's all kinds of things that lead to people that, that perhaps do it the other way. You know, everything from perfectionism to, oh my God, I'm down 1%. Let me go risk 50% of my account to make that 1% back. You know, and you're taking a really bad risk, uh, you know, just because you have an issue with seeing a minus 1%. Um, you know, and then sometimes having those layers where you have investors that are putting, you know, undue pressure on you can also affect the way a manager performs. Um, I, I would imagine the more successful people do this in, in some variety, you know, whether it be intuitively risk more when they're up, intuitively risk less when they're down, uh, or, you know, if they have it modeled out like this. Um, but what's nice about this is, is there's no, um, 
there's no question, right? If, we, if we're doing a fixed ratio, let's go back to our example of, you know, if we look at the MOC trade, uh, the risk is three points, which is $150 per contract. You do six contracts. Okay, well here, do five contracts. Here, do four contracts. Here, do five contracts. Here, do four contracts. Do four plus five, right? I mean, and then as you get up here, oh, okay, my risk is $150, do 21 contracts. You know, it, it, and you know this ahead of time, right? Because if this, is the, if this MOC trade is the only thing you do, yesterday you walked away with that amount of money, you ran your spreadsheet, it said risk this amount, you're sitting around all day waiting until 2.55 p.m. and you know that I'm gonna hit the button with 21 contracts. Yeah. Um, you know, and it gets more complicated if you have various systems that are all in the same pool of capital, all that kind of stuff, but this is the simplest construct for one system, one strategy. Um, and and I, I would argue that how much you bet on each uh, trade is the most important factor, more so than, you know, because, you know, let's just say we're even betting a 75% system. You know, we're, what's it, two, we get a little bit over 200,000. Now, let's say, okay, well, the system's only 66%, but we're doing fixed ratio money management on it. And you had much higher outcomes. Uh, and let's do a smaller number just so we can see more granularity. You know, you, you still got above that 200 and something here, 700 and something. You know, I mean, let's drop it to 60% win rate. And, you know, it, it, maybe it takes a little bit longer to catch that streak. But once you get that streak, it, it, you know, it all goes back to that, those streaks all the way up to 13. You know, have one of those while you're increasing your bet size and you just get one of these, these phase shifts in your, in your P&L. And, you know, maybe you have to just grind win, loss, win, loss, win, win, loss, win, loss, loss, win, loss, win, loss. All the stuff is grinding. But over the course of 250 trades, you hit that win, 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 win. I mean, let's see what the data point here is. This is 193. 209, so you had 16 wins in a row. And you know that, that happens once in a while over 250 streaks. And it's over those streaks that you end up making a big chunk of it. So it's gonna end with a philosophical note. I, I didn't, yeah, I, I thought I might, uh, I didn't, it wasn't long enough. I could take some questions, but I, I was afraid that I, I tend to get long-winded. Um, but uh, does anyone have any questions about stuff. So I guess at the end of that, sorry, you got to jump in when you got an exciting speaker like this. Yeah. So at the end of the day, for a trading system, your standard is whatever the cash in your account is, whatever the, uh, the equity uh, curve, um, that's your criteria and function yeah that, 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 that's your measurement is your equity curve so um, you know think of it as a um, do you ever play blackjack not particularly At a casino <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if you walk into a casino with a thousand dollars and you know you're playing you're playing you grind down to 500 bucks you're probably not playing as big because you've got X amount of time left before your flight, and you're like, hey, I still want to be able to play the rest of the weekend. Um, and then vice versa, if you just got lucky and you're up two, three, four, well, you might find yourself taking bigger bets because this is the house's money. Um, and, and it's just kind of the, the same concept. The, the difference there is you don't have an edge against the casino, whereas in this, you know, in, in theory, you do have an edge. And what I used to do, you know, back when I was trading heavily, uh, if, if I had a rut in trading where, you know, when you have a rut in trading, you're supposed to just keep doing the same thing. You know, your, your position sizing algorithm is telling you how to size it. Your, your uh, trade system itself tells you what the entry, exit, all that stuff is. You're supposed to just keep going. But the human nature is, God, man, this isn't working. I don't want to do it and take another loss today. That, that's all just the, the human psychology. I would actually go to Vegas or like Charles and go play blackjack. And the reason I play blackjack is because I count cards. And that is now a closed system that is in your favor. And you're just getting the repetitive behavior of understanding that all I'm supposed to do is keep doing what I'm supposed to do. And now I'm getting the positive feedback that I'm winning. Um, and so sometimes just my psyche needed that reinforcement that when I was hitting a rut in the market and doing what I'm supposed to do and it's still not working, I need to go somewhere where I'm getting the positive reinforcement that doing what I'm gonna do is gonna work and that's in a closed system. 
Um, Oh, they raised a lot of more good ones. Any other? Right, we got some more time here. Yeah, I have a question. So, whenever you have a trading system, you want to trade on something. So, how do you decide to trade on what? Like, is it that you design the trading system based on what you trade, or is it usually the other way around? Um, like, how do you develop a trading system? No, 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 like, um, once you have a trading system, what do you trade, and how do you decide on it? Okay, so. Um, your trading system should tell you, like for example, this MOC system says every day at 255, this is the trade you take. Yes. I have certain filters that say, hey, if the volume is such, if the volatility has been such, uh, if it's a special day like the end of the month, like options expiration, mm -hmm. those are better than, than other normal days. Because you know, when you think of a day like options expiration, somebody's got an incentive to push it one way or the other. Yeah. Because they have options worth way more than the underlying uh, that are being settled based on that price. Um, so if those conditions are met, you should take it every time. Yeah, may, may I ask for a definition of MOC? What's that? May I ask for a definition of MOC? I'm not oh, oh, I'm sorry. A MOC just means market on close. And that's just the name that I give the trade. It's not technically market on, it's not a market on close order. Um, but I just call it the MOC trade because it's basically the order imbalance at the end of the day mm -hmm. uh, that's getting all resolved in that, in that five minute uh, period for people that want the close. So do you trade on marketing guys for that? Yeah, like like the these charts, I think were the S and P five hundred futures. Mm -hmm. uh, that one was crude oil, but but yeah, th these were yeah yeah this was S and P five hundred uh, futures. Gotcha. Um, and you know, I would imagine a similar thing goes on for the Nasdaq, but perhaps the indexing is more to S and P. Um, and uh, you know, same thing happens in crude. You know, I've noticed it in crude before. In natural gas, on contract expirations, it happens, but otherwise, I haven't seen it happen a, a whole lot. Um, and again, you know, there's like a world of, of things that you can um, test this way. It probably works on certain individual stocks. You know, if, if a fund needs to buy X amount of a stock on the close, you know, things like this can could happen in, into there. But uh, uh, so this just opens up, you know, one idea that can be spread in a lot of different ways. So if, you know, if had a ton of resources, you know, at my disposal, we could test this on a bunch of different markets. And there may even be a, be a market better than the S&P that this reacts on. And, and just because the S&P is going down, down, down on its close, I mean, first of all, crude's uh, close is 130. Uh, you know, the, the pit closes at 130 versus S&P closing at 3 o'clock. So if, if all you did was this one trade all day long, well, you're kind of sitting on capital all day, then you're putting it to work for five minutes and then you're done. Well, you can use that capital again for five minutes at this time, and all of a sudden you've increased the rate of return on your pool of capital. You know, and perhaps uh, the DAX, when that closes at 10.30 Central or 11.30, depending on the time zones, uh, but daylight savings, um, you could, that's a third one you could add to the list, and it doesn't take any more capital to make that money if it has an edge and you can trade it the same way. Um, and then all of a sudden you've basically tripled the type of returns that you're making on, on your pool of capital uh, because you've got three separate trades that are, that are non-overlapping. Um, but the majority of stuff that I do is, is called price action and technical analysis. Um, on my uh, YouTube channel, I've started uh, posting some of the edges that I trade. You know, and a lot of it has, to, some of the stuff I showed you in the class, uh, the last class where a very simple bar by bar method of watching when uh, daily higher highs or daily lower lows are made, and then looking to a shorter time frame to catch a you know a counter trend uh, pattern that you can then get your gains in the size of the the daily direction, but your risk is really limited to that you know 15, 30 minute, five minute chart um, based on on that pattern. Uh, that's what I've been working on a lot more now. Just as I get older, like, I mean, I, again, I, I, don't, I really don't trade that much anymore. Um, I, you know, I do some consulting, I have a fund, um, just, there, you know, I've got you know, almost have four kids uh, at this point, and, you know, there, there's just other things in life that want to want to work on. Um, but what I like about that two time frame system um, that I, I've done several videos now on, the, on my YouTube channel is just that there's a little bit of time and focus to set it up, but once you set it up, you let it go because it's either going to hit your target or hit your stop and treat it like a roll of the dice. It's binary, you know, okay, six, it hit the stop this time, I lost, you know, but, um, but then apply the money management on how you um, risk for the next time. And between those two things, you know, I think that 
you know, that gives me something that maybe, okay, maybe it takes 30 minutes of my time in the morning to actually stalk the, the actual pattern, and then I can just let it go and do the rest of the things that I'm trying to, trying to do. Um, but that, uh, you have to fit something, again, that fits your demeanor. Uh, you know, this is a one-minute chart, right? If, if you fumble with a mouse, this is, probably isn't for you. You know, if, if, if you know how to program it, you know, um, that's probably even better for you. Uh, you know, and maybe in 10 years, this will be really hard for me to do. You know, it, 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 everything kind of changes, and, and it goes back to stay aligned with your uh, demeanor, and I think that's when you'll, you'll have uh, the most success. And going back to that question earlier of what wealth is, this was just one of my favorite quotes on, on real wealth. And, uh, that's just small to read. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of philosophical. Um, and it's funny, I found it in a book called The, uh, the Hedge Fund Edge <laughs> by Mark Lusher. Um, but the thing about the markets, at least for me, and maybe that, that's how I know that trading in markets is the right path for me, I'm very passionate about it. And every time I develop a new edge, it just excites me because to me, it's just like, wow, this is an infinite source of wealth in the world. Um, and the rest of it is just your own demons. You know, if you don't follow your own rules, if you risk too much, if you risk too little, if you are inconsistent, you know, the rest of it is controllable. Those are controllables. Um, and uh, are always thinking, always growing. Uh, and I hope this is something I can, you know, continue to do until I'm 70 because it just, you know, keep your mind working. Um, you know, certain things change, certain things always stay the same. And uh, I think there's always a way, you know, applying scientific method to anything will always find, you know, find a, a little edge for you in, in whatever you're trying to do, whether it be trading, whether it be starting a business, whether, you know, and the information is different. If you're trying to start a business, you probably learn about advertising, you probably learn about clicks and Google and how to do all that stuff. And that's part of the reason I started the YouTube channel is I just I want to learn how that works on the back end. Uh, and it's something that I watched forever and I just figured I got to jump in and do something to see all the analytics, analytics they have uh, on that. Um, but, um, but yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. I was wondering, is there a similar thing to the MOC that happens at Open, since that's kind of one of the biggest periods of movement? You know, there possibly is. Um, one system that I have on the list to test, which, you know, I have a very long list and very little time, uh, and it actually happened today. Um, I don't know if I could pull up today's prices on this. Probably not. But uh, so this is something I got from a guy named Peter Reznicek. Uh, he does a lot of stuff with market profile, which is looking at the volume distribution of, uh, of where the S&P trades or any market. When you gap out of the true range of the previous day, so uh, today we, uh, you, know, you know, yesterday we had a certain range in the S&P, the NASDAQ. I was watching the NASDAQ this morning more closely. Um, we gap above yesterday's high. When you gap completely out of that range, um, the, the first trade of the day typically goes counter to um, the direction of that gap. So one way to do that, you could say, once that first minute bar is printed, I'm going to sell stop below that one minute bar with a stop above it. And today, that would have returned like eight times your risk. Would have been would have been huge. Um, you know, it doesn't always work. Uh, but you know, there are also certain other conditions. Like, you want to look at um, what the overnight trading did. So if you know the the majority of the um, market got caught off guard and was short, then maybe that wouldn't necessarily happen. Maybe it would continue to burn higher if it was kind of a more balanced thing and it just kind of happened early. And part of that is, so again, these are the, the so look behind the numbers and behind the, um, uh, the conventional stuff and, and think about what creates these edges. Well, there's a certain type of person who's trading in pre-market. There's a different type of person who's trading from 8.30 forward. Um, certain people may not have a mandate to trade before the pit open. Certain people have a mandate to do whatever they want. Certain people, you know, maybe just focus on this and then they have a day job, you know, or, or maybe their funds focuses specifically on, on that, that less liquid time. So there's kind of a changing of guard at 8.30. And so whoever rode this up, they're all thinking, well, let me take my profits. I did great today. And they initially start to sell down. And, and maybe you have a bunch of eager people like, oh my God, a gap up. I'm missing out. I'm missing out. I can't do anything until 8.30. I'm missing out. I'm missing out. And then they jump in at 8.30 and get flushed. 
Um, so, you know, just, just like the structural thing with the MOC trade where, okay, mutual funds get that, that 3 p.m. close. Um, it, it's often these kind of structural differences that lead to edges that will uh, persist over time. Um, so I haven't discovered anything that, that's as straightforward as this, you know, with the trending. Um, but that, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, on the open, which, you know, gapping out of the range maybe only happens one in five days. Um, but, you know, again, you could, you could do that on crude. You know, crude has its own pit session. You can do that on natural gas. You can do that on S&P, NASDAQ. You know, all, all three of them probably trade very similar. Uh, all of the indices probably trade similarly. Um, but, uh, but, yeah. I would like to point out that if you were to go to one of these presentations hosted by one of the exchanges, the CME or somebody like that, or the Association of Technical Traders, these would be thousands of dollar seminars uh, for to have an instructor like Ron Don uh, go through what he's talking about. So thank you very much.